Well, hey there. Uh, this is Linda Baumgarten from the Connecticut Real Estate Investors Association, and Happy New Year. Um, I, it's really going gangbusters. I think 2018, in Connecticut anyway, it provides a lot of opportunity for buying real estate. Our real estate is still underpriced. We're probably about 21% underpriced, according to the state of Connecticut. And at the same time, money is getting looser. So that if you do want to go to the banks, uh, there are more banks that are willing to lend to you and probably even more importantly to your end buyer. And I think it's just a great opportunity. So I'm glad that all of you have come out of the woodwork. Some of you are brand new in this industry. Some of you have been investing in real estate for 30-some years. And this topic today is going to be important for everybody because although I do talk about where's the money as far as uh, getting loans, uh, you also know that, uh, you know, Joanna Lou, you've met them, and also myself, we've done a lot of deals using, uh, you know, creative financing. And Joanna Lou, when they started their whole portfolio, they did all of it through creative financing. And you've heard lots of success stories at all of our monthly meetings about people who buy real estate without using their own credit, without going to a bank. And Nicole, whom a lot of you know through CT Rio when you first call, that she's the one that answers the phone. She told me about Augie, who primarily teaches in Florida. Um, but also teaches around the country, and he is from New York, he said. Uh, he's done 598 real estate transactions without going to a bank to buy it. Imagine that. Imagine what your life could be different, how it could be really different if you really master the whole art of making offers and creative offers so that you can acquire properties, help people solve their problems, and make a really good living, a fortune probably, uh, just uh, but without going to a bank. So I asked Augie to jump on the call here, and today he's going to be talking about how to make offers that get accepted. And we only have about half an hour to 45 minutes together today, but he is going to be teaching all day Saturday the 27th, January 27th. And please attend. I, you know, these Saturday seminars are probably the best bargain, the best resource that all of us have because you get to work with a trainer for seven, eight hours plus, you get to network with everybody who's in the room and you can find out about deals and contractors and ideas from other people that are actually doing this business and get your questions asked because, you know, from personal people that are right there and right then. So it's going to be this Saturday, the 27th. Uh, please listen to this entire call. At the end, Augie's going to uh, be giving us a gift. And I want to make sure that you hear about that gift just for, you know, for being on this call and hearing about that. So uh, without any further ado, Augie, I'm really excited to have you share with us how to make offers that get accepted. Thanks so much, Linda. I'm really excited to be here today, too, because when you learn how to buy without cash or credit, it just takes all the limitations away. And to me, that's the most exciting thing. You know, when I first started out, I was using, I did use banks. And... They were slow, they were cumbersome, they required large down payments, lots of things that just impede our business. But when I really started to put together a system that allowed me to buy as many properties as I wanted because I didn't have to go to the bank, because I could close quickly, because I had many more alternatives to provide a seller, it just helped our business to explode. So I'm really, really excited to be here today. And so why don't we get started? Because I think one of the things that you and I had talked about was this idea of transaction engineering. And so that's a place where I usually like to begin my talks because it's the antithesis of what most people think when it comes to buying real estate. Most people go to an agent, they find a property on the MLS, they go to a bank, they try to get approved for a loan, and you know, 45, 60 days later, they own a house. But transaction engineering is really the ability to build a transaction from the ground up using something that I call intellectual capital rather than using your own cash or credit, credits when you go to the bank. And what it really involves is non-traditional or what some people call creative financing so that you never do need to go to a bank to finance your deals. And one of the reasons that going to a bank, and, and I don't tell people never go to a bank. If you want to, go for it. But you have to understand as an investor, we're looking to build portfolios. We're looking to turn a high volume of transactions. And banks have rules, which since they've got their money, you know, it's the golden rule. 
He with the money makes the rule. And so they're usually going to review your personal credit. They're going to look at debt to income. They want relatively large down payments. For investors, it's usually a 30% down payment. So that really diminishes whatever capital you've got pretty quickly. And if you don't have any capital, it puts you out of the business right from the get-go. Plus, their approval periods usually run 30 to 60 days. And if you run into a motivated seller that needs to close in a matter of weeks, not months, again, working with a bank is going to put you out of the deal. The other problem that I started to run into early on was that banks will restrict the number of loans that you can get. And so in today's market, most banks in the country will limit you to only four loans. And I know that I couldn't survive on the cash flow from only four properties. So I want to be able to have the flexibility to buy all the properties that I want. And so, you know, I mentioned this idea of intellectual capital. That's simply the blending of financial literacy and creativity. Because when you learn these skills, these techniques, these strategies, it's kind of like the sun. The sun just keeps shining, and it's giving off energy. And it's the same thing with transaction engineering and intellectual capital. Intellectual capital is a completely renewable financial resource. It doesn't run out. And that's why I think it's such an important thing for an investor to capitalize on. I agree with you right there, Augie. I mean, I uh, I get opportunities to buy real estate all the time, and if I I wouldn't be able I, I'd have to stop buying if I didn't know these kinds of strategies because of the limits of how many mortgages you're allowed to have. Exactly. Instead, with transaction engineering, you're only limited by your desire and creativity. So that gives us control over our future rather than placing it in the hands of a bank. And honestly, banks are there not to serve us. They're there to serve their shareholders. So I know that I want to protect me and you want to protect you and do the best we can to build our financial futures. And that's why I think, you know, being able to develop and employ intellectual capital to help us to engineer transactions. And the other part of transaction engineering is that I want to sit across the table from a seller or a buyer and look into their eyes. I don't want to have somebody who's a middleman in between me and the end result representing me because I know what my limits are. And so does a principal, a seller or a buyer. They know what they're capable of doing. And this allows us to hammer out a solution that's mutually beneficial. My whole business philosophy for my entire life has been win-win or no deal. And that's another thing that investors have to get comfortable with is the idea that sometimes no deal is actually a good outcome. Because many times it doesn't mean no forever, but it means not now. You know, when I was a new investor, I chased a lot of things. And I was forcing the deal many times. And that's one of the errors that I made. And so I also want to help investors to avoid common mistakes. You know, because you and I have talked at length about, you know, different kinds of things that maybe we did when we were first starting out that we certainly wouldn't repeat and that we both want to make sure that our students learn from our mistakes so they don't have to repeat those mistakes. Absolutely. So, you know, <clears throat> there's plenty of mistakes that you may want to avoid, but there are five key mistakes that I encourage people, no matter how experienced we become, we've always got to look back to our basics because those things are so foundational. You know, it's like being a little kid in school. We learn the ABCs. But we use those ABCs for our entire life. Just, you know, think about the alphabet when you learned it as a little kid, but you read something every day, whether it's a road sign, whether it's a magazine article, you know, no matter what, we're always reading. Same idea here with, you know, sticking with basics and fundamentals. And one is paying too much for a property. You know, I like to put it this way. Never fall in love with a piece of real estate. If you have to fall in love, fall in love with the deal. What I mean by that is the numbers need to work. We have certain disciplines. We have certain formulas that we use. 
And as long as we operate with those formulas and within those disciplines, it's nearly impossible to mess up. You might from time to time, you might misestimate something, or there could be a surprise in the deal that you did not anticipate. But if you have good disciplines, there's normally some room even to absorb a surprise and still make a profit. It's the folks that overpay or that they overestimate what they're going to sell the property for because they weren't disciplined in their approach. You know, a, a wise agent once told me, you can take a $150,000 house and dip it in gold, and you're going to have a gold-plated $150,000 house. You're not going to sell that house for a, a million dollars. So <clears throat> that's mistake number one that folks should avoid, and that's paying too much. The next one is more not from a transactional perspective, but it's more from a business perspective. You know, it's important to remember that we are in the real estate business. We're not in a real estate hobby. And so lack of marketing, lack of lead generation can be a big problem for investors. If we're not generating leads, we're not growing our business. But what I've seen happen often, especially with new investors, is that they chase one or two mediocre leads instead of filling their pipeline. You know, when you learn the, the fundamentals of this business, there's five basic steps. One of them is pre-screening. And if you can't identify motivation in that seller, then it's likely you should move on. But what happens is we get so, oh, I had my first lead, and they hold on to that like a dog with a bone. And while they're wasting time on an unmotivated seller, they're not out there finding more motivated sellers. So when it comes to marketing, we should always be marketing, even when we have deals in play so that the pipeline is always full and we can kind of cherry pick the best possible deals and the most profitable deals. The third is one I'm sure you're familiar with from your students at times, analysis paralysis. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, right? You know, I, yep. I've watched so many investors that they do – so much research before they make the offer that by the time they're ready to make an offer, a savvy investor has already bought the property. I'm a big believer in control, then verify. What I mean by that is put the property under contract, then validate all of your assumptions. I'm not saying bid blind, but get some comps, you don't have to be perfect, but you want to be in the ballpark. Get a basic repair estimate so that you can then create some offers. Once something is accepted, you still have a right of inspection. And based on that inspection, you can always go back and renegotiate or withdraw the offer. And for those of you that might be really nervous about, oh my God, what if I can't get out of it? Never put down more money than you're willing to walk away from. I've put $10 down on more houses than I can count. And even today, when I've got more money to work with, I still try to put down $1,000 or less. Usually, $100 is more than enough to secure a property. But we've bought plenty of properties just putting $10 down. And as long as your contract, your purchase and sale agreement, says if the buyer is unable to perform then the seller can keep the earnest money as complete and liquidated damages. They can never come after you to say, hey, you tied up my house. Hey, you owe me more money. And we're not looking to tie up people's houses. When I do an inspection, I usually go for a 10-day inspection period because I don't want to, you know, inappropriately take somebody's house off the market. I want Because when I make an offer, I make the offer because I want to buy the property. I'm not trying to find ways out of a deal. I'm always looking to find ways into the deal. I want to justify my assumptions through my inspection period, and if I find out my assumptions are inaccurate, I'm going to go back and readjust. If the seller wants to work with me, they will, and we'll come to terms. If they don't, then we part friends. I want to be as ethical as I possibly can when I deal with people, because even on people whose houses I do not buy, 
I want them as a future referral source. I want them to know that I've done my best to find a way to work with them. And if we're unsuccessful, that's okay. Maybe there's a way we can work together in the future. So I don't ever want to burn bridges. The fourth mistake that investors make is they do not develop their skills. And what I mean by that is you take an NFL team and Monday through Friday, these are the biggest, the best, the strongest, the fastest athletes in their sport. And yet they're out there practicing five days a week for hours and hours and hours to play 60 minutes of football on Sunday afternoon. How many investors or people that call themselves investors fail to practice at that level so that when they are in front of the seller, that they are on the line where they can earn twenty, thirty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, they just flood their way through it because they don't build their skills. Building your skills is one of the absolute keys to success in this business and it's one of the things that I love because it allows everybody to have the ability to get really, really good at this and enjoy tremendous success. But it depends on the attitude that you go into it with. So not building skills, big problem. Easy to fix, practice. But it's not just a matter of practicing until you get it right. You want to practice right through that until you never get it wrong. You want to be able to handle objections. You want to be able to create offers. You want to be able to pre-screen. These are all things we can learn. There's none of these were I born with, and I know you weren't born with them either. But look at us now. But that's only because we've put in the time, the energy, and the effort to become masters of our craft. And last but not least, the fifth point or the fifth mistake to avoid is just taking action willy-nilly. I developed something many, many years ago that I call the T principle, T-E-A. And it stands for an acronym. It's a, it is an acronym for take effective action. It's not just take action because you can spin your wheels. You know, hamsters on a wheel, they take action all day long, but they get nowhere. Whereas if you think about the actions that you're taking, how is that specific action leading you closer to your goal or bringing your goal closer to you. If it's not serving one of those two purposes, then that action is probably unnecessary or going to prove itself to be unproductive over time. So we want to always look at increasing our effectiveness. So you don't want to pay too much. You want to keep marketing. Don't get sucked into analysis paralysis. Build your skills and take effective action. And just those five things will elevate anybody's business to another level. Now, the other thing that we wanted to talk about today was creating irresistible offers. You know, I said you want to practice not till you get it right, but till you never get it wrong. The reason for that is we want our offers to be totally irresistible. And there's a process. There are some thoughts that go behind this. And I want to briefly go through 10 steps that will create irresistible offers. Fair enough? Yeah. The first one is always deal directly with the property owner or owners. Now, how do you know who the property owner is? That's the party that's on the deed. You can find that on your public record. It's online in almost every county in the United States. But I just simply ask, are you the owner of the property? Because every now and then you're going to get a call from somebody who is related to the owner, they're the owner's friend, they're the niece, the cousin, somebody, but they are not the owner of the property. They cannot convey title to you. And if you waste a bunch of time dealing with people who are not principals, you're going to go through all this work, energy, and effort to find out you have to do it all over again with a person who can make a decision. And worse yet, when you're doing creative types of transactions, the odds of whoever you're talking to conveying that information accurately to the owner is slim. It's one of the reasons I don't like to work with real estate agents unless they are actually my student and they understand how I do business. 
because they can't convey my wishes exactly as I would convey them. So if I'm sitting across the table from a principal, I know I have a much higher probability of success than if I have any kind of intermediary. So number one, we want to deal directly with the property owner. And number two is we need to learn certain information because if we don't learn that information, it puts us at a severe disadvantage. We have to understand what is the seller's problem? What is that motivation? What is driving them to put this house on the market for sale? You know, it's really kind of interesting. I've moved a number of times in my life, and I've not enjoyed it once, having to pack, having to go through all the gyrations necessary. It can be a real pain in the butt, so to speak. So I need to learn what's driving the seller to go in this direction. Because once I understand their problem, I can start to address it. Now, when I do make my offer, I want to be the one making it, and I want to do it face-to-face -face whenever possible. Now, we buy a lot of houses, especially here in Florida, from out-of-state owners. We also do a fair amount of probate business. Now, probate is a situation where somebody has died, somebody inherits the house. And many times it's an out-of-state relative. So how can I be present when I make an offer? Well, kind of the same way we're doing this webinar today, there are tools and technologies out there that will let, that will let us get to be face-to-face -face with the people on the other end of the transaction. Yes, you can mail an offer. They're going to read it. They're not going to hear it. They're not going to see your expression. You're not going to get a chance to gauge their response either. You can do it by phone. You can do it by email. Email expresses virtually no emotion. And so it's very easy for someone reading an email or reading your offer to not understand or to misinterpret or they see one thing that's out of line in their thinking and you're dead in the water because you have no opportunity to educate, communicate, or even say, oh, that was a typo. Because sometimes you will send out something that may have an error in it. But if that's the only thing they're seeing, that's what they're going to believe. So there are things out there like Skype. I happen to like something called Zoom, Z-O-O-M. And I believe it's Zoom.us. You can use it for free if you're just making you know, a call to one other person. It's video conferencing. It works very well. People only need an Internet connection. And since you can do it for free, you can't beat the price. But the beauty of it is, like this webinar capability, you can screen share. You can show them an inspection report. You can show them a repair list. You can go through photos. You can do lots and lots of things and really have an intimate conversation like you're sitting in their living room. And that's very powerful. So be present when you're making the offers. Next, never present a single offer. You know, the, the old adage for real estate investing was lowball everything, throw it against the wall, and see if it sticks. And so the philosophy was send out a 1,000 offers and somebody's going to say yes. I even met a guy one time. He would mail out offers to people unsolicited with a deed, just inviting them to sign the deed and mail it back to him. Now, I have no idea if he was ever very successful, but it just goes to show you that some people just think a volume of work is going to produce a result. And they do say that even a blind squirrel finds a, an acorn every once in a while. <laughs> but rather than shotgunning, I'd rather use a rifle shot approach. And so I want to be very specific to whom I market. That's number one. But number two, I never want to produce, present a single offer because a single offer puts us in a yes, no kind of environment. And it makes further negotiating sometimes difficult, especially if you're simply presenting a cash offer because our cash offer is always going to be our lowest offer. But when you become a transaction engineer, you've got some other tools at your disposal. 
And that's what's really powerful about the way we approach the business because we're going to make multiple offers. We're going to make a cash offer. We're going to do one that's some cash now and some cash later and maybe one that's no cash now and more. Sorry about that, Hockey. I don't know what happened there. That's okay. I was... <laughs> Just to know okay. we're live here. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's good to be live. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a reminder, uh, this is a good point. If you have any questions or comments for Augie, there is a message, uh, a chat box there. You can do that. And uh, I'm just dittoing everything that Augie said, but rather than repeating myself over and over again, whatever Augie's saying now, you should be taking lots of notes because it's for sure true in real life, um, and I appreciate that. And he'll be here all day Saturday on January 27th, so we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. But uh and I appreciate you guys jumping on the call, but he'll be here all day Saturday, 20, January 27th from 9 to 4. So imagine how much you can learn from him being able to spend all day with him. So, anyway, Yeah, we've got a on. massive, a massive <laughs> amount of material that we're going to be covering on the 27th. So it is definitely something you should be reserving the time for, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the keys with making multiple offers is not just having the numbers, but it's how you deliver the message. What I teach my students to do is to first set a framework. And if you use it, you know, it's like building a house. We start with a slab or we dig out a basement and, you know, we build on top of it. But my point is we need a good foundation. Then we frame our walls. Then we put the roof on. There's a process. And it's the same thing with getting offers accepted, right? That's what our focus is today It's how do we get offers accepted. You want to make them irresistible. So I'm going to tell people, I'm going to give you three different ways that I can buy your house. And I'm never going to say it just that way. I'm going to say, I've done the research, I've done my homework, I've run my numbers, and I am so excited. I found three different ways that I can buy your house. As soon as I say that, I watch their body language. They actually, their shoulders drop and they lean forward. And when you do the same thing, I want you to watch people's body language because now you've got their attention. My first offer, know this, it's going to be all cash, but because we don't work with banks, we work with private funds and other ways to buy properties, and the funds tend to be costly. So know this, it's going to be my lowest offer, but if you want all cash and to be completely finished with the property, that's one way you might decide to go. Now, if you don't need all of the money immediately, what I can do is I can give you some money now so you can move to your next destination, and I can give you the balance sometime in the future, either in installments or in a lump sum. But that's going to get you a higher price because I don't have to go get all that money now, all the cash. Now, if you're in a position that you don't need cash now and could benefit from either installment payments or a larger lump sum in the future, that might be what's best for you. And you see, the reason I'm going to give you three offers is because I can't presuppose to know what's best for you and your family. And just like I pause now, I pause then. And the reason for that pause is to let that sink in, that I'm not just here for my own benefit. I'm here to help you and your family get the best situation out of selling this property. And I'm not going to try to shove anything down your throat. So once I've laid out this framework, then I can fill it in with the numbers. And where nine times out of ten, they would have balked or gagged had the first thing out of my mouth been, here's my all-cash offer. And they go, holy crap, that's really low. I didn't expect enough of that low. I've already cushioned them. They're already braced, and they also know there were two more offers coming that are going to be higher and higher still. And many times, if I can negotiate the right terms, I can pay full retail, sometimes even more than retail, because if I can buy it and pay them for their equity in installments, if my installment payment is low enough to give me great cash flow, 
I don't care if I never own the house. Okay? I would pay a fortune. Why? Because I'm going to get tremendous cash flow. So I never have to have the property become free and clear. If it's a great rental and I can get it for two or three or five hundred dollars a month and I know I can get five hundred or more in cash flow a month, to me that becomes a money machine. And as long as I can control the title, whether I ever have it paid off or not, doesn't really matter. It's the cash flow that I'm attracted to. Plus, I'm going to have a fixed monthly payment for however long I'm making those monthly payments. But my payment is fixed. But over time, my rents are going to rise. So I'm going to make more and more cash flow as years go on. Now, number six, we need to be prepared to help the seller understand our offers. Now, sometimes my offer might be an option with a lease attached to it. So I have to explain to them what that means. It means I'm not going to buy your house today, but we're going to agree that I can buy it for some set period of time. But during that time, I'm going to pay you rent every single month and cover all of your costs. And then I'll have the right to sublease that property. There are other times that we might put a different structure in place, but I don't want to use a lot of technical jargon. I want to explain it very, very simply. If I'm going to buy the property subject to the existing mortgage, which may be a new idea for some of you, well, I'm not going to say I'm going to buy it subject to the mortgage. What I'm going to simply do is we're going to go to closing. I'm going to take title to the property. I'm going to put some money in your hands. I'm going to continue making the mortgage payments until we get the property resold sometime in the future, and the mortgage gets paid off but you will not have to worry about any more of the expenses of owning or operating this property. We want to keep it in layman's terms. We want to keep it simple. And number seven, let them know the benefits of working with you. See, I tell people all the time, I'm willing to pay you a fair price. I'm willing to buy the property in its present condition. You don't have to fix anything. And I'm willing to close on the date of your choice. If you need to close in seven days, 10 days, 15 days, I can get that done. If you're not going to move for three months, but you want to just know you're not going to have people traipsing through your house or have to put it on the MLS and stay home on Saturday waiting for people, let's put it, you know, let's sign the agreement now. Okay, we can okay the paperwork, we can put it in escrow, and we'll close on the date we put in the agreement. So you've got the comfort of knowing you can make your plans because the property is sold. So we always want to put benefits first. Now, number eight, your lowest offer is going to be your all-cash offer. And we use a formula for that. We talked about it, and we'll talk about it again on the 27th because you have to have formulas but you want to make sure you've got enough room in the deal that you're going to have profit built in the day you buy. Now, that profit may come in the form of a lump or chunk of cash, or it might come in the form of cash flow. But we do not want to buy properties that start losing its money on day one because you can never make up for that with volume. So we want to position that lowest offer. Now, silence is really the negotiator's secret weapon. We have to pause periodically to let things sink in. We also have to pause periodically to let them formulate questions and hit us with those questions. You know, in one of my seminars, I teach people, you know, to stand up and yell, I love objections. I love objections. Is he insane? Yes, I love (laughs) objections. Why? Because it gives me an opportunity to provide additional information. Nine times out of ten, an objection isn't an objection. It's not that they don't want to work with you. They don't understand something, and they're uncomfortable. So when we learn how to respond, we can become very impactful. And then finally, I always like to ask people, if we don't come to terms, what's your plan B? And if you heard a little inflection in my voice there, like I was a little bit incredulous. You need to do that too. You know, when we are 
working with sellers, we are actually in a role. And you have to take on the role, just like Robert De Niro takes on a role. And you have to be an investor. You have to be an interested investor. You have to be concerned about the outcome of the transaction, not just for you, but for them. I tell them right off the bat, I want to find a way that we can work together that's mutually beneficial. Let's agree if we can't do that, we'll part company. What that does, it relaxes them immediately. Why? Because I'm not going to stay there beating on them until they sell me the house. I'm going to stay there until we can find a way to work together that's good for them and good for me. That changes the whole dynamic. It also makes them more willing to share and divulge information that I might need to help them get their problem solved. So those are the 10 things that you can do to get more offers accepted. That's awesome. <laughs> now, I would really encourage you all to join us on January the 27th. We're going to be talking about owning nothing and controlling everything. You know, that's one of the things I love about this business. We make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on properties we don't even own. We also own a bunch of properties that we make money on. But learning the concept of control without ownership can be extremely attractive and extremely profitable. And if you don't have to pull any money out of your pocket to do it, that's a big deal. I want you guys to be able to do 600 deals with two bank loans or less. I have students that have come to me before they knew anything about real estate investing and have never been to a bank. And that's pretty cool because that means they're ahead of me because I do have a few bank loans on my, on my history. However, out of the last 600 deals, only two having bank loans. What we're going to focus amazing. on are three of my favorite subjects for this business. Wholesaling, we're going to do some of that in the morning, and just that's where so many people want to get started, and I want to give you, the, the, those of you that are interested in getting started in that area, how you can do that. But understand this, when you start to wholesale, you're going to be generating leads, and not every deal is good for wholesaling. So if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense if you've got that lead, you've already invested money, time, energy, and effort to get that lead, wouldn't it make sense that even if it's not a good wholesale prospect, you find a way to profit from that deal? You know, one of my old instructors used to say, you know, if you don't learn this business the right way, you're going to step over dollars just to pick up dimes. And as I've gotten older, I don't like bending over to pick up anything. So if I'm <laughs> going to pick up something, it better be the dollars, not the dimes. We don't want to step over those dollars. Options are a powerful way to exercise control without ownership and creative financing that's the keys to the kingdom because when you learn how to buy properties using creative financing techniques and that's what I'm going to be showing you on Saturday the 27th the only limitations are those you place on yourself you want 20 properties you want 50 properties you want 100 properties whatever it is and the beauty of these techniques they're not limited to single-family houses or condos. They can be used on shopping centers. They can be used on commercial property, multifamily, apartment buildings, even raw land. So please, for your future, join us on the 27th. I guarantee. Okay, if you haven't learned something valuable by noon, I'll refund whatever it costs you to show up on Saturday out of my pocket. That's how much I believe in this. And most of you that were at the meeting last week know that I've got kind of an altruistic purpose behind why I want you all to be successful. And I'll tell you more about that on the 27th. But you need to be there. And I'm thrilled that Linda extended the invitation and has arranged for this call. I hope you got some blessing and benefit out of it because – this business lights me up, and I hope you can catch the same kind of fire that I have because it has changed my life and it's changed the lives of a lot of other people that I know, love, and care about. This is the link where you can sign up, www.ctria.com forward slash events. Linda, is there anything else you wanted to say 
about Saturday the 27th. Well, the location Lauren, is and that, anything else that folks need to know? Yes. Uh, just one thing, uh, well, two things. Uh, you're, uh, just want to remind you, you've intrigued me. You have a gift to offer, so I wanted to hear about that. Yep, yep, but, uh, I promise we'll get to that. Don't <laughs> go away, folks. But uh, Saturday, uh, we also include lunch. I recommend you dress business casual. Bring business cards uh, so that you can, ne- it'll help you with networking. Bring whatever questions that you have. Bring whatever deals or leads that you're working on. Uh, because uh, the leads that you threw in the trash, uh, pull them out of the trash, bring them on Saturday, and I'm sure you're going to have some insights and be able to start turning some of those back into money. So really encourage yeah, you. Yeah, if we have up. time at the end of the day, <clears throat> we might be able to do a little deal-a-thon. Oh, so cool. we can take a look at some of those deals and see how you might go back to that same seller and create some offers. Because one of the things I love doing is just spitballing deals brainstorming and who knows you show up saturday you might make twenty thousand dollars within the next month so you know uh lou talks about a lot of people here know lou and he talks about how when he first got started he went to a seminar uh, similar to this about creative financing making offers and all that and he had found a deal he actually sold the deal to somebody else and then halfway through the seminar, he realized how he could structure it to make money and to do it himself. So he called his buddy back and said, I want the deal back, <laughs> which the guy was <laughs> willing to do. And then he proceeded to to make money on this next one. And so, you know, if you're listening on this call, that certainly could happen to you because uh, it's what goes around comes around in real estate. So you please, bet. I, you we bet. really want you to show up. If you have any trouble with registering online, feel free to call CT Ria at 860 860- Two six five four four one four. The phone has been ringing off the hook all day. Apparently, Nicole's been telling me so. Uh, she will call you back if she needs to. Again, it's eight six zero two six five four four one four, or we have a chat chat line there. But I hope you guys took a lot of notes. I did record this so you can re-listen to what Augie had to say. If you practice some of this or just absorb it, um, Saturday will be even more valuable. So great. Absolutely. Back to you, Augie. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. So what do we got? We've got a gift for you, and I recorded 10 different power negotiating tips because negotiations is a big part of what we do, but negotiating is simply a conversation. But when you can have it be very intentional, very structured, goal-oriented, it makes all the difference. And if it only let you close one more deal in 2018, what would that be worth? 10, 15, 20, 50 thousand dollars. So you've got 10 negotiating tips. You've also got our pro- property information sheet. And the beauty of that property information sheet is that it also doubles as a script, but it makes sure you gather every piece of pertinent information that you need so that you can create offers that you can go back and present to the seller. Okay, make sure you don't miss anything that's really important. And then finally, there is an audio recording of a podcast that I did with some really savvy real estate investors that run a very popular podcast and blog that can give you kind of a little insight into the way I approach the business. So those are all for you, and here's how you go get them. You go to www.yournegotiatingtips.com or you can simply text GIFT to 203-439-6627. Okay? So screen capture that or write it down, but it's yournegotiatingtips.com or text GIFT to 203 203- Four three nine six six two seven, and you'll receive a link that will take you right to it, and you can enjoy those 10 little videos. They're all pretty short. They're less than two minutes each, so it's not like it's a whole big, long seminar that you have the time for your whole day for, but the beauty of it is they're quick, they're insightful, and they can help you to do more with what you've already got. Last but not least, please join us again on Saturday the 27th, I promise you'll be glad that you did. Linda, thank you so much for having me on the call today. I really appreciate it, and I'm going to turn it back over to you. 
Yeah, awesome. Uh, that was really good information. I uh, just really, I'm glad so many of you joined us on this call, and I look forward to seeing you all on Saturday. Augie, thank you so much. And uh, Vinny, I'm sorry, you're not going to make it this Saturday, but I know uh, another person that works with Augie is coming, so that'll be really great. So look forward to seeing all of you there. All right, have a great day, everybody. Awesome. Bye-bye. See you Saturday the 27th. Mm -hmm. Bye.